Hello and welcome to The Capital Conversation with me, Michael Heyman. Now my guest today is David Spencer Percival, the man who's gone from recruitment royalty to leading a rosemary revolution. His latest venture, Number One Rosemary Water, was inspired by the carefree and long-living residents of an Italian village. Such a good Italian village, I can't even remember how to pronounce it, but he's going to tell us all about it because he seems to have discovered the secrets of long life. But it's not just the secrets to life we're revealing today because with two multi-million pound recruitment agencies under his belt, I'm hoping Dave is going to reveal the secrets to success. David, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. First of all, tell us the name of the... Tell us how to pronounce this Italian <laughs> village. <laughs> it's called Acciaroli. Acciaroli yeah. has the secrets, I understand, to long life. It would appear so, yes. It's quite um, an unusual place. So, from what I gather, they eat a lot of rosemary and a lot of anchovies. So why, <laughs> why aren't we having anchovy juice instead of number one rosemary water? Um, it's, a, it's a special place. Um, highest density of centenarians anywhere in the world. One in ten so, people live to 100. So one in ten people, so 10 percent. Yep. So how many, how many people in the UK live to, to 100? Uh, one in 7,000 people live to 100 in America and about one in 3,000 in, in Europe. Right, so, and you're convinced that rosemary water is or rosemary is the, is the <coughs> reason why? Yeah, I mean, the scientists went down to the village trying to find the differentiator because there's thousands, tens of thousands of Mediterranean villages. Uh, but this one is off the scale um, with its uh, density of uh, older people. And they're healthy as well. They're not sort of, you know, um, suffering. They, uh, and they, they're not particularly um, <clears throat> healthy in the typical respect you'd find someone healthy. They're not doing going to the gym. They're, you know, they're, they're Italian. They're eating, they're drinking. Some of them are still smoking. So it's a very unusual place. Scientists go down to the village realise that it's they're eating a lot of rosemary and rosemary has this incredible anti-inflammatory and antioxidants and in their report they said we think they're living to this vast age in vast numbers relatively healthy because of the amount of rosemary they're eating mm. so I, I just read the articles that were in the UK and you know so, slightly so, sensationalist so for the slightly you know, cynical yes, yes, of course. it sounds like an advertiser's yeah, dream yeah, I, mean, yeah. well, 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 I mean it's a great in, article in terms of in terms of the what makes it true, though, I mean, yes. you really feel that you found an answer or part of an answer with some of this, Well, right? the articles, I mean, it was all around the world. You know, I saw it on the BBC and it was in the Times and the Huffington Post and everything. So I read it and I thought, well, that's interesting. You know, note to self, must eat more rosemary. Um, but then it started to dawn on me that I wouldn't eat it every day. It's almost impossible. And it doesn't taste, it's quite a strong taste as well. Mm. So I thought, I'll just drink it, you know. And then I sort of realised that nobody made a drink. So I, so I made it. Um, and this is now a high-end drink. You find it in bars. Yeah, um, it's in about... Oh, God, one and a half thousand outlets now. Well, yeah. and, and also supermarkets, but it's not cheap, is it? Three three ninety five a bottle. For a big I mean, bottle, the secret's yeah. a long life. And it doesn't, it's not, doesn't come cheap, does it? It's expensive to make drinks. <laughs> I mean, no, but the, it, no, the extraction's quite complicated. I mean, I went into it. I didn't know anything about the drinks industry. I mean, so you can't yeah. just stick it in your tea. No, I wish you could, <clears> but to extract all the thirty two compounds is actually quite complicated. It doesn't boil down into a into a tea. It doesn't come out of the herb. It's it you know it's, it's science, botanical science. Mm. I mean, and you've you've got some some high-profile backers. I mean, yep. you know, the man of steel himself, Henry Cavill <laughs> Superman, is very much associated um, with, with the business. Yes, he's he an is, investor, yeah. isn't he? He but, is, yeah. yeah. Uh, Superman drinks rosemary water. Um, yeah, he's, he's a really cool guy. Um, so it's one of his superpowers, is it? <laughs> it would appear so now. Yeah. Um, he's utterly charming, and he's a, a, a big shareholder now. And, yeah, he's really he's on a journey with us to, to, to amplify the message. We've just been down to Acciaroli with him, shot a documentary. He's, he's really cool. Mm. But, I mean, I suppose that there's, there's two sides to this product, isn't there? There's, there's the side which is... Um, Here's something which actually might help me with memory and it might help me with, a, with, mm. with lifespan. But here's something that actually you might drink with vodka or other spirits. And I've seen it in, yeah. in, in bars. No, it's a great mixer, yeah. Right. Uh, yeah. So, it, it does work as a mixer. You know what? So is that the trade off? <laughs> yeah. Uh, Look, I, 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 the village is a wonderful story. It's, it exists, it's there, you know, there's all these centenarians there. We did trials on our own drinks, so we did clinical trials and we, we proved that it improves memory and, and concentration, so it does work, you know. But, but I, mean, y I mean, you were slapped down a bit by the Advertising Standards Authority yeah. told you to tone it down. I mean, what? what uh, I, I didn't know you couldn't advertise health claims without this very specific well, European... That'd be true. Well, <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> so, no, you, you just can't do it without this, yeah. F, this thing called an EFSA, which is a, a, a fiendishly complicated thing to get from the European food standards. Um, so I was sort of happily saying, oh, you know, it's antioxidant, anti-inflammatory, which, which it is, but you have to attach that to your product. Mm. And so the ASA came along and said, you, you can't do that. So they sort of pulled all our advertising. Uh, it, was, it was a hard so, lesson so you've learned. Had to learn. You've learned lessons about... Yeah, I mean... I, 
had, yeah, I just qualifying the claims. Yeah. But I mean, I mean, lesson seems to be a big theme in in your life. <laughs> I mean, you know, we, I mean, we, I mean, we've got a life that includes fashion, yep. banking, recruitment. And rosemary water. I mean, in <laughs> no, terms of like, you know, journey, yeah. what, 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 is, is there a threat? I mean, is there, is there, a, um, I mean, I mean what, what gets you to rosemary water? I guess um, I proved myself as an entrepreneur with two recruitment companies, you know, to, both to 100 million turnover. Um, and I just wanted to prove that I could do something else and just see how good I was. And I wasn't really looking for anything else. But then I read these articles. And I genuinely thought, you know what, nobody's actually made this drink mm. before, so somebody should. And that's I mean, really... I mean they often, see, I've often think of this as with entrepreneurs, it's like second album issues, isn't it? You've done, you've proven yourself as an entrepreneur in one field. Yeah. Third, well, you're on, yeah. to, you're on, a, you're on the full, you're yeah. on the full career. Yeah. But I mean, I mean, in terms of, yeah, okay, is this against all odds? I mean, yeah. I don't know. It could, that could be the album title. But I mean, in terms of what takes you away from something you know really well yeah. into something which presumably begins as a bit of a passion project. Sure. I mean, I mean it's, ter well, it's terrifying because you're <clears> out of your comfort zone. I mean, com you're out of your comfort zone in a startup anyway, but you're completely out of your comfort zone doing something you've never done before in a startup. Mm. That was that was pretty fit. And I'm not, I'm not getting any younger, you know, I'm not, I'm not 25 years old. But you've got form about putting things on the line, yes. haven't you, in terms of actually yeah. just turning your back on one business, going, going to another. Yeah. I mean, um, Huntress was the first yep. business, yep. a recruitment business, then Spencer Ogden. Mm. Um, each one of those times, there seems to have been some major moment where you've given <coughs> a lot of things up, including yep. at one stage a, a pretty opulent life with a lot of a fine collection of classic <laughs> cars, from what I was reading. Yeah, one for it, every day it, of the week. Uh, <laughs> one for every day of the week. Um, I think it's a bit of a cycle with me. I think it's, a, and I've kind of worked it out. It's about a seven-year cycle, and it's pretty well documented. You know, I just wake up one day and I kind of sell everything and start again. It, it's so just what, who what I am. What drives that? Is it, are, are you a risk junkie? I mean, is that is that part of uh, the... I don't think so. Otherwise, I would have probably done a, a lot more. I mean, I do the project from start to finish. You know, I start it. Okay, so I you're focus a on it. Yeah, I don't do anything right. else. I just start something. I take it through to its fruition. I work incredibly hard every day. And then I get it to where I'm comfortable with, and, and, and then I... I do something else. But I suppose that in having read your story, the bit mm. where, you know, you're kind of like reading it and thinking, you know, here's a guy, he's got, he's got a house, he's got an art collection, he's got classic cars. I mean, it, against a lot of very successful people's mm. metrics, that's kind of like, almost like job done. Then you sell the <laughs> lot, everything, and see Twice. all of that on a business. I, uh, it, what, it, how does your wife feel about that? She's incredibly supportive, I have to say, because every, she knows this company. She's, she's part of your, she's a co-founder of <coughs> Absolutely, of, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. And so you've done knows, this as part yeah, of Every time she right. can see the look in my eye when I say, I'm going to go and make rosemary water, and she knows what's coming. You know, we sell the house, we sell the, the, the material. The thing is with the material and stuff, you know, you build up to this, and everyone says, oh, look how comfortable you are. I found it a little bit hollow. I, I enjoyed all the trappings, but it's a little bit of a circus. Mm. So for me, it's very cathartic to strip it all back and start again. But, I mean, I, I guess... The theme that keeps coming up here is mm. fast growth firms. Yeah. Um, yeah. In terms of, I guess, if you look at what it takes to do that, I mean, you've worked with Sir Peter Ogden, you've worked with, yeah. with some guy. of the best, right? Yeah. I mean, in terms of if you were to sort of give some learnable lessons about what it takes to scale quickly, what yeah. it takes to grow, how do you keep... How do you keep the show on the road? Um, I think you have to be very careful about listening to lots of people. You can't run a startup by democracy. You know, you have to make a lot of decisions very quickly, and you have to have just like a singular vision because so many people want to give you advice, spend your money. You just get so distracted in startups, and I think if you just so you've got to have a determined sense 100%, of journey, yeah, right, uh, and a sense of purpose and focus. Otherwise, it, things don't get done. I mean, mm. I'm I'm a great but it just get stuff done, and yeah, sure you break stuff and make mistakes but generally speaking if you're if you're getting on a trajectory you, you sort of plow through it I mean what one thing I was thinking about your your kind of restarts mm. is that um, when we wrote mission one of the pieces we wrote was about burn the boats you've mm. got to leave things behind and I was reading how you said you couldn't be a leader of a startup driving a Ferrari because nobody would you know it was almost yeah, like I mean, you'd, you'd be sure to fail you've got to get back to that really nitty-gritty sort of wheeler dealer kind of feel about it because every penny is is important and if you yeah if you've got all the trappings of wealth you know you, you just don't you're not in the zone it is the startup phase the bit that excites you the most I love it it's the best bit. So recreating yeah. the, the first buzz of three that. to five years. I mean, I've been on the Sunday Times fast track six times now. You know that fast growth pace, just getting stuff done and getting it driving forward. Because there becomes a point when actually 
companies don't run themselves, but they run a lot more efficiently. Mm. And, and I guess their, their growth slows. What's the big difference between running, a, a, I guess, a consumer-facing brand mm. as opposed to a business-to-business -business brand in terms oh, of the commercial journey? It's completely different. I mean, it's just chalk and cheese. And I did sort of go into a slightly rose-tinted glasses, you know. Oh, I'll just make a drink. You know, it's just so easy, doesn't it? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, it's nice. What's it's, the pain it's, point? What's, what's the thing you um, found It's difficult? fiendishly complicated because you're dealing... You know, before, I was dealing pe with people, which, you know, have their challenges. This is about a product. You know, you have to make it. Then you have to distribute it. Then you have to sell it. Then you have to look after it. You know, it has this sort of mass of spinning plates around you um, that are quite complicated. And, and do you feel differently about this brand compared to the others? Um, yeah, yes, I do. Yeah, this is uh, this is very much a brand, and it's very, very important to me that we get it right. And it's incredibly healthy. It's all, it's, we're doing everything for the right reasons. So for me, this is this is really personal. Right. That personal story we're going to continue with when we come back after the break. And when we do, we're going to find out the motivations behind David's success, a passion for purpose, confidence, or is it just something in the water? We'll be right back. Welcome back. My guest today is number one Rosemary Water founder David Spencer Percival. Now, I was frazzled, to be honest. Not what you were telling me in the break, <laughs> but actually your comments about an earlier part of your career, you got to a place where you'd overloaded with your, fr with your first business, Huntress, was that right? I did, yeah. I sort of was, it was growing at such a pace. I, I kind of decamped to Ibiza and just had to, you know, what, stop burnout? really. Uh, was was it burnout? Bit, was a bit burnout, yeah, I think so. Yeah, running pretty fast and then, uh, uh, you know, sort of felt quite exhausted, actually. Mm, have, you, have you been sort of close to that again in, in life? Or, is, or have you learned, have you, or are they um, coping? Twice, yeah. Well, after, you know, you go through this enormous startup phase and then you kind of sell the business. I think post that, you get this kind of real fatigue. And uh, first time I went around America for three months and just did a big road trip. And second time, I just kind of went up into the hills in Ibiza and didn't come back. Mm. I mean, it, it often, when you hear a lot of entrepreneurs' stories, you've mm. got this, 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 this general tension between the great intensity required to get something going and then the potential personal cost in terms of just how you feel effectively frazzled as you've said I mean you well know, you just don't have a life you know you're dealing with thousands of emails a week and if you don't get through them they just pile up and then you get really stressed so you have to just trundle through it and it just it's just non-stop you know and, and is there a sense that that survival is at stake in terms of the business I mean at what, at what point what's what's is, is that what's driving it the insecurity of of, not, of not, not having the story not, done yet. Not for me, because I, I'm, mm. I'm a, a bit of a risk taker and I have an awful lot of confidence. Um, so for me, it's it's not about there's so much at risk. It's for me, it's about getting it. So do you done. always? Because I mean, the, uh, some entrepreneurs mm. I've interviewed, you know, th there's a sense of almost like. Th th I guess the failure is one step behind. That's what's driving them. I mean, yeah. you're, you're saying more about. You know, you almost assume that you're going to make it. Is that? Is that? How, yeah, how do you get I that positive mindset? A, uh, I, I don't know. You know what? I think I was. Born with it. I think so, yeah. Because but are there, I just, but I just, things, you know, but are there things sort of... you can learn about it? I mean, is there... um, I, I don't know if you could teach that. It's, it's difficult to teach sales and confidence. But you know, I, I, yeah, for me, it's not failure. Just doesn't sit in my head anywhere. I mean, in terms of actually this business and the purpose mm. that it, it's giving to you. I yes. mean, you've, you've, you've had a. I mean, a lot of what you read is about. I guess, a struggle with material objects and wealth versus something else. I mean, you said here, when you're as shallow as I, as I am, you buy things just because you can. I, d I don't think you are <laughs> shallow at all. I mean, there's actually a bigger issue here about your place, your purpose. I mean, sure. that, I mean, in terms of in terms of actually turning your back on, on yep. the material side yep. of this, I think I have, this, I, have the, I have a bit of an extreme. I mean, I like capitalism and I, I, I don't dislike money it, it creates a wonderful life for you but I also have this feeling that I could sort of give it all up and, 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 and go and run a farm you know that's my kind of character it's a bit all or nothing which is why I go to these extremes build these companies really quickly and then just kind of crash and drop drop out a bit so the roadmap for number one rosemary water mm. I mean at the moment you're, you're financing the business I yep. mean, in terms of its journey I mean mm. presumably this this will be another chapter will it yeah this is a whopper though I mean this is a 
$1.8 billion brand. We created a drink that didn't exist. That drink then moved on to Royal Botanic Gardens Q where we've created, like we've just opened up nature's medicine cabinet into 10 other drinks. So, so, it's, so it's, tell this us, is, this is, this so is quite tell us the Q Gardens connection. So yeah, we, we were dealing with rosemary water um, and the scientists said, look, there's other herbs that have significant health benefits and they haven't been made into drinks before. Go and see Q Gardens, went to the professor who runs the botanical science at Q and said, look, this is ancient herbal medicine before pharmaceutical medicine. If you make drinks so out of it. So we could see other other drinks, could we? There are now nine others coming, yeah. Right. Well, what, what, are the, what are the other herbs that we can well, expect each of to them, see? Well, each of them that we curated with Q have a significant health benefit. So, for example, meadow sweet is where aspirin was isolated from. Um, there are, you know, just a number of these herbs that have, they were used for antioxidants, anti-inflammatories, and they are like a medicine cabinet, but it's much more prevention, not cure. Pharmaceuticals are cure. Mm. Botanical science is about prevention. It's very and, different. And, and, for, and for the doctors that are watching yeah. a show like this thinking, this guy's selling fake science, this, yeah. this should be about prescribed medicines, yeah. not about drinks you can buy in the supermarket. What, what's your answer to that? What's the responsibility to, uh, here? My answer to that is 50% of all the drugs that we take now through pharmaceuticals come from nature. So nature actually provides all of the medicine that we have. It's just synthesized and mass produced. So, you know, it's ancient wisdom. It's 2000 years of, of herbal medicine. We've just forgotten about it and kind of left it aside. So and we're rediscovering something that has always been historically yeah, it's, important It's what us. they make drugs from anyway. We're just putting it in its natural form, putting it into a drink. Mm. And that I think is quite exciting because it's just, no one's ever done it before. Right, let, let's try and get into your personality a bit. Yeah. Um, you had, um, a father that you described as aggravatingly confident. Yeah, he was. Tell and very, very bright as well. <laughs> yeah, he just talked to anybody, you know, and he'd have this sort of overriding confidence. He was fiercely intelligent. I mean, academically, he was really bright. Um, and he just yeah, exuded confidence. And I guess, you know, I was always in his shadow a little bit. Always in his shadow. Yeah. Was going, I was going to say, as how, I was how, growing up. How yeah. did that rub? Because, you know, it feels like you want to prove things. You've got, yeah. you, you're on a mission to do things. Yeah. Is, that, is that partially driven by that? relationship do you think? it could be yes I mean unfortunately I didn't speak to him for the last 20 years of uh, his life um, but I think I look for that far I mean Sir Peter Ogden's a great example you know he was this person I looked so up a paternal to paternal figure I think so yeah and and you know he was a great business partner so yeah I, I kind of think I looked for that mm. I mean you left school at 16 you're one of uh, I think that Lloyd's his youngest teller uh, from what <laughs> I was, I, was yeah. uh, I mean and so I mean and shortly after that, you moved, moved to London. I did. I, uh, I to, to the horror of my parents, I moved into fashion and just kind of messed around for too long, actually. Really, I had a great time there. You know, I'm an old raver. I was just a sort of, you know, I was, I was, a, I was, a, I was in Ibiza every Jackie, summer. And did you have the same, <laughs> same body shape as Robbie Williams? So, <laughs> that's coming well, from the research. Yeah, yeah well, so. my wife was the stylist for Take That, and she used to borrow my clothes for Robbie Williams. Um, but, you know, I had a great time, but then I kind of had to grow up. You know, 26 years old, I thought, I better start doing something relatively important with my life. And you describe yourself as a complete loner in London. Um, I um, was, yeah, you, yeah, you I didn't know anybody, arrived. yeah. You, and you saw, but the uh, great thing about London is you find your tribe, you know, you congregate with the same like-minded people and then you have them with the rest, all, all through mm. your life. But they're not my old school friends, as most people have in their, in their town or village. You but know. what does a loner want to do? Do they want to fit in? Do they want to stand out? How, I'm just trying to get a sense of what, I, how, how the next chapter's emerged. It's difficult to, I mean, you know, sort of... <sighs> I look back and I think, you know, my church was Acid House, you know, and I became one of those people that just got consumed in the 80s and 90s with it. And then really from that point on, that's where I found myself, you know, I was just confident with who I was, I guess. But I mean, I, I think if, if you'd said to me that actually that then took me into mm. Rosemary Water, I would, I would well, have I got I, that, but well, it took I think you I'm in. Going back. But, no, you but know, I'm saying, yeah. if, but in terms of that journey point, that yeah. you, you'd done the fashion piece, you're on the club scene, and that's then taken me into drinks. But mm. you didn't go there. You went no, to one of the most years. corporate yeah. parts of the economy. You know, you go, well, I think, you go into headhunting. Well, I think I have a slightly addictive personality, and I think my addiction to certain things then started to be addicted to money and success. And I met my wife, who was much older than I was. I think I just grew up. You know, I thought, okay, I didn't know what. So I didn't, it's a lot I didn't of time to get a proper job. Yeah. Right. And when I got the proper job, I sat there and I thought, actually, I can do this. I can probably do this better than everybody around me, because that was my confidence oh. coming through. And then just focused again and, 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 and sort of just, and it, you know, 20 but can years you later. Have this, as an entrepreneur, can you have the same passion that you obviously have for this new drinks business and you obviously had for your, mm. you know, the fashion rebellion, yeah. as you've, you've called it in the past? I mean, mm. 
when you get into something like headhunting, can you have the same passion, the same feeling? Yeah, for about... sure. I mean, I jump out of bed at six o'clock every morning and go to work and do the best I can. You know, I've always, that, that's who I am. And I think that discipline, it, it just, it doesn't matter where your focus is. It can be anything, no matter how interesting or boring. Um, as long as you focus on it, it, you can make it exciting and make, you know, money's exciting. You know, who doesn't like to be able to go to nice places and drive nice cars and have mm. lovely houses? You know, there's a certain, there's a certain addiction to it. Um, so for me, it was just, okay, I'm on this journey now. I was on that journey. That was great. I had fun there. So I'm on this one now. Let's make this one work. I mean, and you mentioned, I mean, fast track yeah. experience is part of this. Mm. I mean, is there anything you miss about the bigger business that you've kind of left oh, behind? For I sure. Mean, you know, Every time you, you so, know, I, 40 people in my IT department, you know, I could pick up the phone well, so the to... computers work. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, this whole, this whole sort of, you know, surrounding sort of structure. And when you go into a startup, well, the walls fall away. You can't phone up HR and there isn't HR. There's no, there's so no one what, in your so company. So why, why consistently recreate it? Why not stay with it? Um, because I have a low boredom threshold and I also have a cycle, as I say, when I, I, I work incredibly hard to get it done. And then there is a point when I say, I, I think I've done what I'm really good at the startup phase. I'm not massively good at running big companies. What does it take? You've got to know what your skill is, don't you? Is, I mean, a lot of entrepreneurs. I mean, mm. they, they 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 do as as you have that confidence. But what when, when do you get the insight that perhaps I've got this business as far as I can take it? You and just it needs know. A different, you just know. You just wake up one morning and say, I think I. It's know, literally I think, I think somebody better than me could do a better job than me. Mm. I mean, how, how good a time do you think it is to be an entrepreneur in, in London and in the UK right now? Um, UK is a little bit tougher than a bit of a headwind, but I think we'll get through it. Um, America's booming at the moment. Asia, you know, Europe, uh, London is probably the best place, I'd say. You know, you've got and lots that, of ways to raise money and there's lots of, uh, you know, inspiration. And uh, it's a great incubator for startups. And, and we're right at the end, but if I was to wave my, my magic wand <laughs> and take you right back, you could start up anything you could do right now. You could start yeah. it all again. What would you do? I'll be a superstar DJ. Superstar DJ. Take that. <laughs> right. <laughs> Thanks very much. David Spencer, first of all, my guest today, the man with the keys to a longer life and a better business. Uh, it's been a story of sacrificing the lot in the pursuit of success, and it's also been a story of knowing when to change track and when to trust your instincts. And if you're looking for more tales from the top, join me again for the next Capital Conversation. I'll see you then.